Um, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to the Cape Times and Karen in particular for inviting me to speak. Um, just a little bit about why I'm here at the moment. Um, I've actually just finished making a documentary film with uh, Donal O'Neill, who some of you may know made a film called Serial Killers and Run on Fat. And really this is about looking at the Mediterranean lifestyle, Mediterranean diet, and looking at the secrets of longevity and heart health. So hopefully, come May, June, we'll have something that could be quite interesting for people. And um, you know, we aim to impact upon global health and influence health policy with it. So today, um, I'm going to speak to you around a topic called You Can't, Can't Outrun a Bad Diet. Now, some of you may be familiar with an editorial I wrote with Tim Noakes, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, earlier this year. So a lot of what I'm going to speak around is, is based upon that editorial, which was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So, you know, why are we actually here? Why are we having this discussion around diet? Why is it such an issue? Well, in the UK now, 60% of the adult UK population is either overweight or obese. I mean, that's staggering. And that figure, I mean, I've given this talk, you know, and, and presented these stats many times in the last couple of years. And it still never ceases to amaze me. And for me, perhaps more disturbingly, one in three children in the UK, by the time they leave primary school, by the time they reach 11, are also in the same category. According to the UK Foresight Report, if we do nothing, 90% of the UK's adult population will be in the same category by 2050. Obesity alone is costing the NHS around £6 billion per year. And actually, the bigger problem is not so much obesity, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on that a little bit later, but it's the diseases associated with obesity. So type 2 diabetes, current costs to the NHS and the economy due to lost productivity is close to 20 billion. And if, if we fail to act, that's going to double in the next 20 years. And non-communicable diseases and diet is a major risk factor. And again, where does diet come into this? I will come on to. Um, has now overtaken undernutrition as the commonest cause of death worldwide, contributing to 35 million deaths per year. And diet is one of the major risk factors there. And the final question is, is obesity just the tip of the iceberg? So, you know, I think the first thing for people to acknowledge, which we haven't really fully acknowledged until more recently, is that the root cause of this problem is the obesogenic environment. Everywhere you go in the Western world, it's become almost impossible to avoid processed foods, whether it's at the petrol station, whether it's in gyms, whether it's in, um, you know, whether it's the high street, everywhere, it's very difficult to avoid cheap, sugary processed foods. But for me, and this is where my journey began as a doctor, the biggest scandal is the fact that we've even allowed our hospitals to become a branding opportunity, and that's what they've become, a branding opportunity for the junk food industry. Um, one of the hospitals in London where I worked previously, um, I found out that actually the number of visitors that walked through the lobby of that hospital, which had a Smith's um, on site, which essentially is a candy store. When I was growing up as a kid, WH Smith was basically somewhere you go for stationery. Now you walk into WH Smith's and half of it is you know, crisps, sugary drinks, confectionery. That's what you see. One of the hospitals had, uh, I found out was, was having about 10,000 visitors walking through that corridor per week. And actually, the science tells us that does make a difference. So um, in, in, in the United States, a study showed that pediatri pediatric institutions that had junk food on sale on site, visitors who went to that institution or those hospitals were four times as likely to purchase junk food when they left the hospital than people who had never visited the hospital in the first place. So it does legitimize the acceptability of these foods. And even hospital trolleys. So, you know, uh, I've been on ward rounds um, and treating pa patients with heart attacks. And if you have a heart attack, you know, conventionally, you should be bed bound really for the first 24 hours. So even pa patients who are bed bound are being brought to them, you know, sugary drinks, chocolates and crisps because there are contracts with the hospitals that ensures that these products are brought to the patients by their bedside. And we talk about education, you know, some of the arguments which I'll talk about in a minute used by the food industry um, and other co-opted members who, you know, who support their messages talk about, it's about education. Well, listen, one, the education is wrong. We know that the current dietary advice has actually been a root cause of the problem. But 50% of NHS employees, of nurses and doctors, are actually overweight or obese. So that in itself tells you that education is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. And this perpetuates a revolving door of healthcare. So Theresa Marteau, who's the Director of Behaviour and Health Research Unit in Cambridge, actually she's a brilliant scientist, and she's looked at food behaviour and 
Uh, and what she says is food choices are often automatic and made without full conscious awareness. And that, again, comes back to the environment. So, you know, despite wanting to lose weight, we're still tempted to buy that brightly colored chocolate bar at the checkout till. And the food industry know that, and they place their products specifically, and they pay uh, retailers um, uh, large amounts of money to have their products in certain positions. And again, a lot of this is just cheap, sugary junk food. <clears throat> Made worse by the aggressive marketing, this whole problem is made worse by the aggressive marketing by the junk food industry who target children and the most vulnerable. Um, in the United States, junk food advertising alone, you know, the food industry spends $4.2 billion a year. And just to put this in perspective, for every one, the balance of power, for every one pound the World Health Organization spends in trying to prevent chronic diseases, the food industry spends 500 pounds in marketing junk food. That's the balance of power, ladies and gentlemen. That's where we're at. And this is important. You know, anyone, I'm sure many of you here in the audience are parents, and pester power through advertising is, is, extreme, you know, is, a, is a big issue for uh, parents who are trying to give their children healthy food. Um, and you know, School Food Trust did a great survey in the, in the UK and found that 72% of parents actually fe felt that this advertising had a significant impact on pester power. So this is something that I've been looking into in the last few years because, you know, in my own journey looking into how we got, you know, to the position we're in at the moment, um, one of the, in fact, you know, one of the major problems or major factors that have, you know, hindered any progress in public health is actually what we call the corporate playbook of big food. And, and if there's anyone who hasn't read a paper, I, I, you know, I suggest you do read, or if you're interested in this subject, Kelly Brownell in Yale did a paper called how big tobacco played dirty and millions died. How similar is big food? And you know, that's a great paper and you can look it up, it's free online. But just to go through a few of these arguments. So what do they do? They focus on personal responsibility as a cause of the nation's unhealthy diet. It's your fault that you're overweight or obese. You know, it's your fault, you're too lazy, you're eating too much. That's the argument, that's what they do. And you can see it time and time again. When you read in the press, when anything comes out in a study talking about sugar being implicated in chronic disease, you'll have industry spokesperson using these arguments. So watch out for them. So that's the first one. They raise fears that government intervention, regulation, um, interferes with personal freedom. But we've got to remember that the greatest public health successes that have taken, past, sorry, have taken place in the past 50 years have actually happened through government intervention through regulation, whether it's safe drinking water, seat belts in cars, smoke-free buildings. And this is what has actually contributed more than anything else to increase in life expectancy. So um, if you look at life expectancy in the last 100 years, since 1900 um, in the UK, it's increased by about 30 years. 25 of those years have happened because of public health interventions. Not because of modern medicine, surprisingly enough, but because of public health interventions. And they also use something called corporate social responsibility. So when the city of Philadelphia was considering introducing a sugary drinks tax, and it was up for debate, one major food company, which I won't name, associated with junk food, gave the local hospital $10 million. And for them, it's pocket money, as you know. Nothing. It's, it's tuppence. And the sugary drinks tax, surprise, surprise, didn't happen. They won the propaganda battle. And this is something that, you know, they also vilify critics. So people that speak out, such as myself, Tim, they, you know, they call us leaders of the nanny state, food fascists, the food police. You know, so they will use all these sorts of types of languages to uh, attack anyone that questions their practices. And they also criticize study that hurt them as junk science. What else did they do? Well, they emphasize the role of physical activity over diet. In fact, for many years, a lot of us have had this perception, in fact, most people, until more recently, have thought that the problem is because of lack of exercise. They support studies and use scientists and fund them to actually try and promote a message that the whole problem is not to do with the food that we're eating, it's because we're lazy, we're not moving enough, we're too fat, because of that reason. And in fact, actually, what we did in May, myself, Tim, and a, a scientist in America called Steve Finney, we wrote an editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that got a lot of attention. Just to summarize, I mean, the first thing to say is, we're not undermining the role of exercise here. In fact, I was co-author in a medical royal college report early in the year called Exercise the Miracle Cure. I personally, you know, I'm, I probably got OCD about exercise. I can't think of, you know, more than two days in the last 20 years where I haven't engaged in some form of vigorous physical activity. I captain sports teams at school and university. I know the benefits of exercise. But when you look at obesity and you look at the overall data, over the last 30 years when obesity has rocketed, there's been very little change in exercise levels in populations. In fact, they've probably increased to some degree because this is all about the types of calories that we're consuming. 
And we need to learn from history. It took 50 years from when the first links between smoking and lung cancer were published in the British Medical Journal before any effective regulation. And that's because the tobacco industry successfully adopted a strategy of planting doubt that cigarettes were harmful, denial, buying loyalty of scientists, and confusing the public. And the extent of that denial was such that in 1994, the CEOs of every major tobacco firm went in front of US Congress and swore under oath they did not believe nicotine was addictive or smoking caused lung cancer. That's the extent of that denialism. We must learn from history because we're seeing the sugar industry doing exactly the same thing. Well, this picture speaks a thousand words. I mean, this is another thing that's a bugbear for me, is how we allowed sport to be sponsored by junk food companies. They know that associating their products with sport gives people the impression that you can have your happy calories from a sugary drink and just run them off. It's complete nonsense. <laughs> so, putting this all in perspective, where does diet actually fit in into the global burden of chronic disease? So, some very good analysis done by Simon Capel in the University of Liverpool in the UK. He's a clinical epidemiologist looked at the Lancet Global Burden of Disease reports at the 20 major risk factors for disease and death. And actually, what we, what we know is that poor diet now contributes to more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking, and alcohol combined. I'm a cardiologist, so let's give you some facts on cardiovascular disease. I don't want to overload you with it, too much information, but essentially, cardiovascular disease is still the number one, one cause of death globally. It's about 20 million deaths a year at the moment. Uh, and, you know, what's probably quite disturbing is that half of those deaths occur prematurely, and that's in people under the age of 65. 80% of cardiovascular disease, however, is lifestyle-related. It's, it's related to an unhealthy diet. And of course, genetics has a role, but this is largely modifiable by lifestyle changes, which includes, obviously, doing regular exercise, stopping smoking. But diet is the most important factor when it comes to heart disease. So I just want to show you this slide because it's quite important to get this concept uh, into your minds. And this is something actually we cover a little bit in our documentary. Is I just want to show you, so this is a normal coronary artery. So this is the arteries that supply heart muscle with blood are known as coronary arteries. This is nice and clear. And here we have what we call a traditionally known as a fatty deposit, which is basically a, um, a collection of lipid cells, uh, inflammatory cells that builds up over a period of time. This is called a, a plaque, and this is a narrowed artery. Now. For someone to get symptoms of angina, which is pain in the chest with exercise and stress, that usually the narrowing has to be at least 70%. The narrowing itself doesn't, cause, doesn't kill you. It can give you symptoms. That doesn't kill you. What kills you is a sudden occlusion of this artery, which happens within minutes. And that's called an acute thrombosis, because what we call plaque rupture. And another thing that's very interesting is most cardiac events, people have heart attacks, don't have significant narrowings. They're not over 70%. They're less than 70%. So a lot of people who present with heart attacks actually present for the first time with chest pain, come into hospital. They've had no history of angina whatsoever. Probably about 50% of those people. So I just want you to just understand that for a second because the, the time frame for, this, for coronary artery disease to develop, actually the, the atheroma, takes many decades. And we know that um, because... You know, uh, autopsy studies in obese children, we can see fatty streaks developing. Uh, autopsy studies in uh, war veterans, for example, we know that it starts earlier on. But it does take many, de uh, many decades to, to progress, and most heart attacks usually occur in people over the age of 60. But the perception is that process, if it takes a long time to develop, the reversal will take a long time as well. And that's completely incorrect. In fact, we know very, uh, there's very good evidence that actually by changing one's diet, and in fact from smoking data, and I'll present some of that in a second, that you can rapidly reduce one's risk of having a heart attack, even if you've already had a heart attack. And that can happen within weeks to months. Um, so just to give you some examples, which I, I still think is extraordinary. In 2002, a place in the United States called Helena, Montana, introduced smoke-free legislation. Within six months of smoking bans, public smoking bans, there was a 40% reduction in hospital admissions for heart attacks. And the reason that is, is that smoking itself, passive smoking, increases platelet activity. So I talked to you earlier about the, the coronary artery, that basically you're increasing the clottability of the blood. When you take that out in the environment, that clottability reduces. So people's heart attack 
the, the levels of heart attack went down significantly. Anyway, um, unfortunately, when the law was rescinded, after the tobacco lob lobby weighed in, the admission levels of heart attacks went back to preceding levels. In Scotland, 2006, we had smoke-free legislation, about 17% reduction in a year of people being admitted with heart attacks uh, and a reduction out of hospital cardiac arrests. Now, how about dietary changes? You know, there is not a lot of randomized control trial data on diet for various reasons, but the, the evidence we do have is actually very strong. And we know that um, heart attack patients that adopt um, a diet which was high in fatty fish actually had a 29% reduction in all-cause mortality within several months just from having fatty fish in addition to their regular diet. Um, there was also a study done in Italy which looked at an omega-3 pill. I'm not a big promoter of nutritional supplements, but it was interesting in this particular study, uh, within three months they reduced um, cardiac event rates and within, a few, you know, uh, uh, within six or eight months, death rates were reduced just from taking omega-3 supplements. Okay, this is a, a great study actually that was published in 2013 called the PREDIMED study. And this looked at the Mediterranean diet versus a standard advice to give low-fat advice. Randomized study in high-risk people, people who didn't have heart disease but at risk of heart disease, um, middle-aged, and basically the intervention group was supplements of extra virgin olive oil or nuts versus advice to follow a, a low-fat diet. And in fact, the low-fat Mediterranean diet actually was still quite healthy in comparison to the average Western diet. Uh, and just to give you the key points, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular events, heart attack, stroke, and death within about 4.8 years. They had to stop the trial early because it was considered unethical to continue. But what's interesting here, if you just see these lines of separation, so this is the number of years as the trial progresses, and this is the event rate. Now, this is a control diet, which I must stress is a, still a rel relatively healthy diet. But the intervention group, the people that were uh, consuming at least four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil or nuts, actually, the event rates started to separate within months. And what's interesting about this, when you look at the data, when you analyze the data after the study was done, this was independent of body weight. So there was no weight loss, significant weight loss between the two groups, and there was no change, significant change in cholesterol. Just to put this in perspective, and again, this, again you know, there's some you know, margin of error with, the, with these studies, but if you look at the best available evidence in terms of randomized controlled trial data and observational studies, you know, just to give it in perspective, if the whole of the US population were to in increase their portion of nuts by one portion a week, within one year you'd prevent 90,000 deaths from heart attack and stroke. Food is medicine. Hippocrates was right. So when we look at this in a public health perspective, this is Tom Frieden's Health Impact Pyramid, social and economic factors and changing one's diet is actually going to have, uh, by making the, the environment better and making people's default choice healthy, will have a much greater impact than counseling or education. So it's important that we acknowledge that, and obviously a lot of people don't realize that. We're looking at the bigger picture. This is an environmental problem, therefore it needs an environmental solution. Okay, a little bit about action on sugar. Um, so, you know, a lot of you here probably, you know, sugar has been in the mainstream media more and more. Um, a lot of very powerful advocates like Karen and Tim have been pushing this message for a long time. But just some very simple uh, things. That the body doesn't actually require any carbohydrate from added sugar whatsoever. There is no biological requirement for it. That is irrefutable. And the fructose component, which I'll talk about in shortly, is, is probably the, the main issue here. And now we've got good studies implicating sugary drinks with weight gain and obesity. And this is something that has been neglected for a while until more recently, and I've been talking about this for some time, having spoken to some leading dentists. The commonest cause of chronic pain in children and the commonest cause of hospital admissions in children in the UK is tooth decay. The single uh, dietary factor, most important by far, is sugar. So even if you get in, before you get into the whole science about obesity and calories, etc., sugar, just from the tooth decay point of view, is a real health hazard. And it also affects adults as well. Um, what's the nutritional value of sugar? Well, there isn't any. It has no nutritional value whatsoever. Um, fructose is probably the, the causative factor around these chronic diseases because all cells need glucose. Although, yeah, I'm sure we can uh, have a separate discussion about ketones, but, you know, <laughs> essentially, you know, the conventional wisdom is that glucose is required, um, but the, the actual impacts of sugar, added sugar, is probably the fructose component. And what the fructose does, it promotes liver fat accumulation and insulin resistance, and the metabolic syndrome. So very briefly, the metabolic syndrome is the issue. It's not obesity. 
And the metabol metabolic syndrome is any three of five of high triglycerides, low HDL, increased waist circumference, hypertension, and impaired glucose tolerance. And why is that important? Well, actually now, 75% of people admitted with heart attacks actually have a normal cholesterol. But 66% of those will have the metabolic syndrome. And if you have the metabolic syndrome versus someone who doesn't and you're admitted with a heart attack, you're 50% more likely to either die or be readmitted to hospital within a year. So it is a major problem. And how important is metabolic syndrome? Well, how many people have got it? Well, actually, this is a bit of a crude slide, and this is provided to me by Robert Lustig um, and referenced in Nature and an uh, editorial hero. But ultimately, the message is 40% of people with a normal body mass index actually will harbor the same metabolic, me metabolic abnormalities as people with obesity, the metabolic syndrome, 40%. So this isn't about obesity. You know, we're all vulnerable to processed foods and the effects it has on our bodies. So a bit of fiction here. So what do Coca-Cola say? They say beating obesity will take action by all of us based upon one simple common sense fact. All calories count no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. But the truth is, the science is, some calories cause more disease than others. Does anybody in this room seriously believe that a calorie of fiber, protein, fat, or fructose has the same metabolic uh, effect on our body? I don't think anybody does. It's ridiculous. It's nonsense. Yeah, this is a message that people keep talking about. Count your calories. It's absolute rubbish. In fact, it's been used by the food industry to market cheap junk food because we know there are less number of calories in sugar and carbohydrate than there is in fat. And that's what's been pr being promoted for the last 30 years. So people have been buying foods based upon low calorie, poor nutrient. You know, they may even be losing weight, but it's not about weight. You know, in my view, there's no such thing as a healthy weight. There's only a healthy person. That's the science. I'll just skip forward a little bit further because I know we have a bit of short time here. Um, just a, a few other bits of evidence. I'll, this will all be summed up, the reason I'm going through this. So a very good study uh, done in, uh, uh, called the Epic Interact study looked at sugary drink consumption in Europe and they found that just one sugary drink uh, per day was associated with increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes by about 29%. Uh, excellent study here done by Stanford University researchers with Robert Lustig and Sanjay Basu. And what they did is they looked at sugar availability for consumption worldwide. We referenced it in our paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, what they found was, looking at 175 countries, for every 100, excess 150 calories of sugar that was available, typical of a can of cola, compared to the calories from another source such as fat or protein, there was an 11-fold increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, but crucially, this was independent of body mass index and independent of physical activity. You cannot outrun a high sugar, you cannot outrun a, a bad diet. I'll just skip forward a little bit because I know we're short of time, but essentially, um, in my own investigation the last couple of years, um, I looked at the sugar labelling, actually, in the UK. Um, and what I found, to my horror, and it still exists in the UK and the EU, the guidelines on the nutritional labelling actually suggest, still, that we should be consuming 22 and a half teaspoons of sugar as part of our guideline daily amount. And I was a bit baffled by this because I was looking at different bits of evidence and I walked into a, a shop one day and I picked up a Mars bar and a can of Coke and I thought, this is interesting. Why does it say, you know, this can of Coke, this, um, this is 39% of your guideline daily amount of sugar? And if you look at um, America, you know, we know that about a third of sugar consumption comes from sugary drinks, but about half of sugar consumption actually comes from foods that people don't normally say as being, being junk food, low-fat yogurts, breads, ketchup. And what happened was, somebody highlighted this, because in America they don't have a GDA or an RDA for sugar, so a website was set up on the US Department of Agriculture's website to tell the public, consumers, if they want to go on the website, how much sugar is in each of these foods. And it got taken down, because the food industry had put forward a message saying that no method can analyze for added sugars, so their amounts must be extrapolated or supplied by food companies, many of which are not willing to make public such proprietary information. The food industry don't want you to know how much sugar is in the food. American Heart Association 2009 come out with a statement saying for the average male, you shouldn't be consuming more than nine teaspoons of added sugar a day. For the average female, six teaspoons. And, for the, and this is something that's neglected. They actually have guidelines for children. For the average four to eight-year-old child, the maximum limit of sugar is recommended before you get adverse health consequences, three teaspoons of sugar per day. This is a, an example of what I was talking about, the labeling. So this is a little bit blurred, but this is a can of Coke. We know about, that it has about eight and a half teaspoons of sugar in it. It says this represents 39% of your guideline daily amount of sugar. I put all this together in a paper which was widely publicized. And in fact, 
I remember ringing Tim before it because he provided a very supportive quote uh, for this paper, which I wrote in the BMJ, that was press released in early 2013. And I was asked to go on BBC Breakfast to speak about it um, and you know, talk about the fact that this labeling was very misleading for consumers. Um, and uh, unfortunately, at the end of the uh, uh, Bill Turnbull, one of the presenters, said, you know, we should add that we did ask 10 different companies or organizations associated with carbonated beverages, supermarkets, sugar manufacturers, etc., to discuss with Dr. Malhotra. Unfortunately, all of them were unavailable. I was so disappointed. <laughs> So we set up this organization called Action on Sugar, which essentially is trying to get the food industry to reduce the amount of sugar they're adding to processed foods. We've calculated that if we get, in the UK, the amount of sugar reduced across the population by about 40% over four years, that would be enough to halt the obesity epidemic and probably reverse it. And that's just obesity. Um, sugary drinks tax is being discussed a lot. It's going to be in the news again next week because on Monday, the UK Parliament is debating whether we should have a sugary drinks tax. And that, um, that would be very interesting. But um, just to put it in perspective, Oxford researchers have calculated just on a 20% tax on sugary drinks, that would reduce sugar consumption by about 15% in the UK population from sugary drinks, and that would prevent 180,000 people within one year from becoming obese. So that's just on obesity. So we set up action on sugar, and uh, you know, these are some of the recommendations. And you know, this is where we're at at the moment. You know, we, we should learn from tobacco. The scientific evidence does emerge. Understanding spreads. Professionals accept the paradigm. And then the public and politicians become aware, which we're at at the moment. And then this is the issue. The opposition for vested interest becomes overcome. And then we need regulation taxation. So just to put it in perspective before I finish, I'm sorry, I'm not, I know I'm running over time. Um, as a cardiologist, and uh, one of the things that I've been also doing is trying to uh, encourage greater transparency in medicine around prescription of drugs. Um, just to put some perspective for you here, so NNT's is number needs to treat uh, for heart disease. So if you've had a, a heart attack and you take aspirin, there's a one in a hundred chance, aspirin is a, is a very well common, commonly prescribed drug for heart disease, if you take aspirin, there's a one in a hundred chance that taking aspirin every day for five years will save your life. One in a hundred. Some of you may be thinking, oh, that's very simple. In, in medical sort of uh, public health, that's actually pretty strong. So one in a hundred from aspirin. What about statins? I won't get into statins debate with you now, discussion, maybe later on if you want to ask questions about it. But statins in people who are high risk, according to the published literature, and I say that with quotes, the published literature, um, one in 83 chance if you take a statin, it will save your life if you've had a heart attack. Aspirin and statins at low risk, if you're otherwise healthy, it won't prolong your life one day. Independent evidence, it will not prolong your life one day. Heart uh, stents during a heart attack, this is something I've trained in, this is what I do interventional cardiology, that's what I've been doing you know, for many years. If you have a heart attack, having a stent is life-saving, 1 in 40. Stents at any other time? Remember back to the slide I showed you about the narrowed artery? Now, actually, if I was to put a stent in that narrowed artery, which is 90%, it doesn't prevent a heart attack or prolong your life. Because coronary artery disease is not a disease caused by eating fat and then a narrowing of the artery, it's a disease of inflammation. So stopping the inflammation is key if we're going to reduce heart attack death rates. And that's what we saw with smoking. So coronary stents at any other time doesn't do that. So what's the most powerful coronary intervention tool we have based upon randomized control trial data? More powerful than aspirin, statins, and stents? The Mediterranean diet. NNT30. But how many people actually know this, know this information? We've sequestered it. It's there. It's available. The data is there. It's available. But how often do patients get told this? You know? And when, we, when everybody in the room knows, the doctor, the patient, the nurse, the receptionist, the cleaner, when everybody knows that a statin or a coronary stent is not going to prevent you having a heart attack, but having a Mediterranean diet after a heart attack is going to be more powerful than all that, then, when you, then you have real transparency, you have better accountability, and only then you can have real quality in healthcare, which is lacking at the moment. So, I think one of the ways to summarize all of what I've said so far is that we are actually up against very powerful vested interests that put profits before public health, profits before patients. And I'll finish a quote from John Adams, the second president of the United States of America. And he said, the preservation of the means of knowledge is of more important, amongst the lowest ranks is of more important to the pub, importance to the public than all the property of all the rich men in the country. Thank you.